And welcome to this edition, this episode, this version, this continuing saga. There it is. I'm going to go dramatic today of Hospitality Marketing, live show number 298. And with me is the uh, ever-wonderful Miss Adele Gutman. Good morning, Adele. Or Good morning. Congratulations. Getting so close to the big 300. The big 300, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I was trying to tell somebody... Um, that if you listen to our shows back to back, you could go for about a month. Incredible. <laughs> I don't know if I anybody I would I would think that they do that in 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 uh, interrogation rooms maybe uh, something that they <laughs> is like talk or we'll make you watch another episode. No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't know, but it uh, it is quite a lot. I, I do come across some of our older episodes uh, when Tim had hair. That's how far back. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I didn't have a ponytail, which is actually not that far back. It's only about a year back. Um, but uh, it, it, it's it's kind of neat to see and to see how it, I wouldn't say evolved, because it's kind of always been this way. I mean, you've had, uh, we've enjoyed your company with the pleasure of your company for, how long has it been now? It's been almost a year, hasn't it? Well, I left the my last company, which was the Library Hotel Collection, but it wasn't really into uh, until... Uh, later in the year when I realized uh, I should just go ahead and move to South Carolina and start something of my own. And actually, I, I'm still in the seed planting and uh, establishing process. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it took me 40 years to master the hospitality business. It might take me a little while to master the Podcasting, public uh, speaking, no. and you're an old hat at it already. Your your podcast is already pretty great and consistent, <laughs> and all this good stuff with it. So I think you're, I think you're, you're selling yourself short on the adoption speed. But I have to say, <laughs> you probably really reflect a very interesting. I'm noticing now, um, uh, just from personal note, we were looking to buy a house. Uh, we have, I mean, we've been keeping an eye out for things for a long time. But when we first moved down here, we downsized from Texas. Uh, now, wow, four years ago. And we had a condo here that we kept because we always thought that would be our retirement place and whatever. And so we moved into it and downsized it, but we knew we didn't want to work there and live there because it was too small to do that. So we went over into some office space conveniently in walking distance from that, which mm -hmm. has been a blessing in disguise with COVID because for us, then we can stay away from everywhere. We just, we walk our dog back and forth to the office and spend our work days in the office and then go home. That said, we always kept an eye on the, on the houses and uh, it just, it's hard We've, we've decided to step away from that concept for now, um, where we were looking at houses that were, oh, you know, $250,000, $270,000, $280,000, $450,000, 500000 right now, untouched from when we last saw them on the market. Because we're that familiar with the market, we know we can actually see the same houses. And we're like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw a statistic on the news recently that Florida – housing went up like 173 percent or something crazy like that. i would that. believe it actually i would it, it's it, it is mind-numbing the, the and again not for houses that oh my gosh they replaced the kitchen or they did this or they did this but it's like nope same pictures we saw a year ago or a year and a half ago when it was selling for under three hundred thousand, and now it's over 400 and almost five hundred thousand for the same house and it's just because the demand that shift and i think and the reason why i brought all this up was, you know, you represent a little bit of that because you relocated, you went from New York okay. and you went to where you are now. And from that, um, you changed your lifestyle. Uh, you've changed what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's changed your 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 perspective on travel, I guess, in, in a way before it was travel because you're centered to New York, travel because of what you're doing with library collection. And now it's less about the travel i don't know film me i mean how do you see what you, when this yeah. thing starts happening more in a normal way how do you see what your world's going to be like well you know what i traveled so much for work that i i really wanted to chill when i had any time off which was so limited you know we have so limited time off in america and and I didn't want to, I, I just wanted, I just wanted to chill. But my husband is like, we have to go someplace exciting. I like, I have way too much excitement in my life. And I just wanted to go someplace where it was green and warm. And here now I live in a place that's green and warm. I have beautiful resorts that I can drive to. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that was just not something I thought about in New York City. I, you know, just thought about, you know, going to go going to another country or perhaps uh, combining a, a trip to Budapest with a visit to um, Austria or uh, Slovakia or Slovenia or whatever it was nearby. Um, how do I combine visiting family in another country with some other countries in the area? I, I definitely think of everything because I can relax beautifully right in my vicinity. And there are so many wonderful places to do it. I mean, Charleston, my goodness, it is such a hospitality town. Mm. And of course, Myrtle Beach is so close. So I, I do really think of it differently. But uh, so so for right now, traveling is just a change of pace, driving somewhere else. And maybe in a year or two, I'll start having, oh, I want to explore Croatia, for example. Sure, sure. That's Get that travel itch again. I'm, I, I, I empathize with what you're saying because for us, obviously living in Florida and having the beaches and places that we do, going to the Caribbean is not as, as exciting as, say, when you were living in New York and wanting to go to the Caribbean. It's like, oh, my gosh, we got to go to the Caribbean because it's, it's so – for us, we actually – because we have family in Europe, uh, when we were traveling back and forth to go see them, um, they were like, well, don't come that time of year. I mean – even the fountains are closed. Is, is you know that was their their expression. Is like you know because you know when it gets cold in winter they shut the fountains off and cover them up for the winter so they don't get damaged. And we're like we don't mind. It's because it was different. It was a contrast, and and it kind of brings a little bit to what again I'm not, not trying to be like ooh super smarty about this, but how we're changing our interest in travel is rather profound, and we haven't really talked about how that impact of okay I don't have to be living next to where I work as much anymore obviously because of housing prices where I live in Florida and so forth and other destination, high destination uh, places are like, oh, I'm just going to live there. That's why I always wanted to live like you did. It's like, hey, look, I always wanted to travel to green and warm. I now live in green and warm. Lucky me. <laughs> yes. and, and may I bring up another point? I can now go for an extended period of time. I can you know, if I haven't decided exactly where I'm going to spend, you know, my, you know, this this later years, I, I should say middle years, whatever it is that it is for me. Hey, you're only 29. Uh, you got a long I way can, to go. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm going to be 60 in December, so I'm going to go straight from 29 to 60. <laughs> but um, uh, I can go and we're into condo for a month in you know mm -hmm. St. Augustine and see what I think of it and right. and and really get to know the place on a different level i can have that deep travel experience driving and i can just have my life still do work during the day go out for dinner have activities maybe give myself a little more leisure time than i would at home mm -hmm. but i could that could be my travel just yes. renting a, a, a co-op or, or a house with a mm -hmm. pool, which I don't have over here. I can rent a house with a pool. I'm I'm actually renting a house with in a pool in St. Augustine. That's why I thought. See, that's why. But, but I'm just going the first, for a pretty good detail, detail there that you're talking about the aspirational <laughs> travel when you're like already talking specifics. And it's like hmm, I just okay. want you to know, but I'm not renting it for a month. I'm going for three days, and then and then I'll see from there. But listen to this. I picked a house with a pool over a hotel because I've had my dog for three years now and I don't know if he can swim. So we're going to find out if the guy's a swimmer and I can't put him in the pool of a hotel. And that's yeah. one thing that, uh, you know, those houses have, they give you a little bit of freedom. Yeah, sometimes. they do. And, and, and I think that for me being who I do and what I've done, I've stayed at, Places for the very same reasons that you're talking about. I wanted, you know, we we decided last year in August that we were just okay. Want to go do something, but we want to do it safely, obviously at that time, particularly particularly and so forth. And so we picked a, a a VRBO that had the criteria, which was it was isolated. It wasn't around other people. Um, the they, they, VRBOs and stuff has these, especially Airbnb has these massive penalty things, which is their under under their, their demise really, um, in that sense because you know unrefundable and everything else is like really that's a pretty heavy commitment choice. Even given that maybe there was a hurricane or something, technically it's still non refundable, and you're sitting there going really. 
If the place got wiped off the map, I still have to pay for it if I was to go there, even though there's nothing to go to. That's the rule. And and it's really, I mean, I'm sure you can mitigate it and so forth, but you're on the you're on the downside of that conversation going into it. You're not there with the ability to do it. You're there to convince people to change the policy. Anyway, um, and, and we did that with the idea of, well, we wanted our dog with us. We didn't want at that time to be engaging with the people because when you have a cute dog, as you know, everybody wants to pet the puppy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and by the way, our dog, not a water dog. He'll sit on top of my head when I try to put him in the pool when we live in Texas. He's like, no, he, he is not. A, he is a sunshine puppy, belly in the air puppy. Yes, but <laughs> not a water puppy at all. But uh, yeah, it, but I think w- what this is providing is that from a, from a hotelier's point of view, or just in hospitality, um, the fact that we have to consider our messaging more and more diverse, you know, what you just talked about, going to St. Augustine for what your purposes were, perhaps there could have been a hotel. Now, I mean, I don't think they could put, do the puppy in the pool thing, but, you know, would you give that up if they went over and said, look, we would love you to experience our town so that you might decide you might want to come here more often and, and longer. And here is what we can provide. And put something together with somebody that yeah. says, we'll be happy to, here's links to local real estate agents that we feel are great people to introduce our city. Uh, here's information about living, the regions, the areas, because hotels really don't talk about that in their content at all. I mean, I don't. I, I don't talk about, this is a residential area next to us. It's like, no, I'm really thinking you just want to stay with me and do whatever you're going to do and then leave. I don't think you're really interested in the fact that it's a wonderful school zone. Just thinking. Um, so maybe, maybe in some strange way, we have to adapt our conversation to include more things that we wouldn't normally have done rather than just, oh, super amazing restaurant right around the corner or, hey, we're right by the beach. It's more like also, we're also next to some really neat communities that if you're interested in getting a feel for the place, we'd int- be having interest in the people that would be able to be great ambassadors to that maybe. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you went, uh, if, if you look at a Dell Webb Properties, for example, uh, which of course they want you to buy a uh, 55 plus. They have all kinds of activities and everything. And they say, come stay for free for a three day weekend. We will introduce you to some other people like yourself who are already living there. Maybe somebody who came from where you come from and, and, and they'll be your friends to, to go and see the activities and get a, a feel for the lifestyle there. So you can make a good shopping decision on, on your new home, which I think is, is such a clever idea. And, and we always should be looking, as you said, at what other people are doing and bring mm-hmm. that idea back to, to hospitality. I like the idea of um, the hotels that are saying, Come and stay for the weekend and take a dog from the from our our uh, humane society mm. and have that dog stay with you for the weekend. And and a lot of people are doing it. They're coming to the hotel, especially to have that experience of of being able to take care of a dog. And and they're taking that dog home very often for a very affordable adoption fee. There was a hotel talking about the fact that they were doing that for the military people who were staying there for long periods of time. And it just made it feel so much more like home to have a dog with them. And very often they took them home. True. I see people keep True. bumping in the antennas. I'm wondering if there's a tech issue on some of our, our platform because I keep seeing, oh. I'm sorry, they keep popping it out. If it's a tech issue, Alexa, the same thing. I keep saying, go, doop, doop, doop. I'm like, okay. I only say that because for some reason, I am the magnet for tech glitches these past couple of days. And uh, platforms that I'm using, all of a sudden, it's like they're having tech issues. And then a day later, I find out that we had a tech issue. We're really sorry. And I'm like, wow, it just seems really ironic that I've had such major tech issues these past couple of days. But uh, no, tomorrow, I, I, don't, I don't know. Because Lex was doing the same thing uh, where he was popping in. I'm like, Usually that means something's not quite working. Um, yeah, there's a couple of platforms I had. And I'm really, by the way, just on a personal grievance note, really pissed at Apple and Google right now because I had bought one of the new Apple M1 chip computers. To this day, and it's supposed to have been fixed by now, you can't access Google Drives uh, the way you normally like Dropbox and stuff on the computer. There's a, They don't talk to each other. Google and Apple are just being really spoiled little brats, or big brats, monster brats. And they're not working this thing out. So my new spiffy laptop, 
that I've been wanting to use since I bought it at the end of last year. It's still partially being used at home compared to where I really wanted it was here working on it. And I'm using my old one that was to replace it now well past this prime because pretty much every fourth or fifth day it says error. We died. We're going to, you know, come back to life tomorrow. Uh, so no, no, thanks, Melissa. Yeah, no, you don't seem to be one popping in and out. It really was just tomorrow and Alexa were going in and out. And I was just wondering whether it was a tech issue or not. Um, and also just remind since I, it, you, you can see we have plenty of spaces to come up here and you know that we do the clubhouse thing during the week anyway. Uh, we welcome anybody that wants to come join the conversation. You're welcome to just let us know in the chat if you want to pop in. Uh, as you can see, it's our typical, hey, what do you want to talk about? So <laughs> all fine for it. But I do think um, from a core note of hospitality marketing, and, I, and from just talking with you, Adele, thank you, I, I've gotten to think that some of these hotels, because a lot of these hotels are looking at ways to redefine making business, doing business. Now, I, I know that that, that uh, some hotels are already too busy and they're actually having to throttle or govern how many people can come in the dorm. Got that. I understand. But I know that's not everybody. And then there's certain hotels that are in locations that are not experiencing that and are unlikely to experience in the near future simply for what they were built for, just as a interim destination or they're, they're, they're uh, in downtown cores and they don't have something. So what we're talking about possibly being a variance to what they're doing is a very viable consideration, whether it whether it is featuring you know relocation people or not. Um, the fact that you have to think outside that term and say, I'm not just selling rooms and rate, I'm selling the fact that I'm here and what can I provide a service that people are going to buy what I have to sell, which yeah. could be those things, you know. Yeah. Um, even even it comes down to the small meeting spaces we talked about before, just that variation of thought, I guess. Um, yeah, people keep talking about resiliency. But you're not mm -hmm. snapping back to what it used to be. You're 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 revitalizing yourself in a new direction. Almost everybody is going to have to change you, the basic principles. Maybe not the basic principles, but their 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 market has changed. Their clients' needs have changed. Their guest needs have changed. Their expectations have changed, and we're just going to have to learn how to. Uh, think about not going back to exactly the way things were before and, and try to come back better and stronger. And I definitely think that al alignment on a goal is the way to do it. And then think, okay, now that I know my goal, you know, how am I going to get there? Hi, Melissa. Hello. <laughs> This is Warm Fuzzy Hour. Welcome, brought to you by I like <laughs> Warm Fuzzy Pillows. <laughs> no, actually, I don't want to even make a pillow commercial. I don't like that dude at all. So I'm not even going to make a pillow commercial. I'm leaving that, that guy out of it, Mr. Whatever his name is. <laughs> uh, but anywho, um, Melissa, we're just kind of talking about, as you can see, we're just kind of like, hey, put a stick in the sand. Um, variations on marketing ideas. Just, you know, uh, that we're talking about the, the relocation people and so forth. It's just a rethink. It's It's... And it sounds grand, you know, really minor and small, and it's certainly not a silver bullet, but what would you like to talk about? <laughs> so, yeah. A couple of weeks ago on one of the Ed and Stewart shows at that ridiculous hour of the morning. <laughs> right. That really crazy, stupid 8 a.m. thing. Yeah. 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 Mm. <laughs> I was sitting in on one of those and we were talking about, you know, the whole working remote from a hotel, that whole concept of being able to do that now more than ever. And people may be wanting to do that now more than ever. And I said, there's one thing aside from money, which I maybe need to ask for a raise so that I could do this in my, in my <laughs> life. But let's just assume money was no object and I really could travel the world and go to anywhere and work. One thing holding me back as a true person who, when I'm working, I'm working. I'm not at the pool working. <laughs> right. I need to work. Right. I need a real office setup. Like I need an external monitor. I need a keyboard. I can't function. I literally cannot do my job with just my laptop. It is like working mm -hmm. with one hand tied behind my back. Mm -hmm. And I assume a lot of people at this point in time are used to having this type of technology when they're working again, unless they're sitting by the pool with a margarita in their hand and doing whatever it is that they do there. 
Wait, 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 wait. Who? Whoa, whoa. Are we bashing Margarita Poolsides? What? what uh, no. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, I can't. That's, do that's that. afternoon lunch. Come on. What? What? <laughs> I'm really comfortable with uh, with just using my laptop, but you know, maybe I just haven't really explored the whole get an extra monitor and a keyboard situation. Oh, they're, not, they're not expensive. Maybe, yeah, maybe I, I actually bought one for Renee at home because not that margaritas run the pool are a bad thing, okay? Let's make that baseline, okay? <laughs> just saying. <laughs> but should one desire not to walk the brief 10 minute walk to one's office and wish to sit in one's living room and do the same work because you didn't. Have, someone didn't have any meetings that day. Uh, you know, the extra little monitor plugged into the side is is because you're right. Multi monitor thing, yeah, okay. And being, uh, you know, having your own everything laid out in such a way that when you leave it, it doesn't get touched again or whatever. Yes. Um, now here's the geek in me. Okay, so I have the VR headsets. Uh, they just did an upgrade, which is so cool. Uh, you, you, before you already have what was called virtual desktop, which was pretty cool. Where you, you put the goggles on and you could have like minority report, all these screens and you could swipe and touch. Okay. Very cool. Totally geeky. I know they just upgraded it where, um, it, it, you have this virtual world. You can see your hands virtually in the world, but to type, you're not feeling or touching anything. And so it doesn't work for me. It's just, I ended up just making the little triggers hit the little letters and that's like finger poking typing and it doesn't really do well either. And even though you can talk to it, it's still, well, they just updated it. So there's cameras on that side of this headset that you can see the world around you. That's for safety. Like if you walk out of your zone, poof, all of a sudden you see where you are. So you don't run into walls or stuff. Well, they've used the cameras to see your hands, your real hands in the virtual world. Now you can, I'll alter how much virtual world you see. So you can see most of your outside world, but you see these screens in front of you in your office. If you wanted to, you just see the screens in your office and you can see your real hands and they connected it to a wireless keyboard. So you can see the real keyboard. Okay. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not picking this up. This is right now. This is, you can go buy these goggles for $299 and uh, download the software for $19 and boom. There you go. And the keyboard is a real keyboard, you know, touchy, touchy keyboard, touchpad on it. You see your real hands in your virtual world. So you could be sitting on a cliffside in Maui, okay, uh, with, you know, looking at the beautiful Vista with your little screens up for six. You can actually put six screens up. Not that you need, well, maybe you do. Six screens up and you have your real keyboard, real hands, and you can do your real mouse and you can work. No more monitors. Wow. That just, mind is blown right now. Totally cool. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it's I like a geeky fest happy day thing for me. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, so you say, and it is, it's like Minority Report. It truly is. Because it's also, you can use, you have virtual hands in the world too. So you can touch things on screens, swipe them, you know, do you can talk to it, say, uh, you know, well, browser, new browser, open, whatever it is, and it'll pop it open and stuff like this. And then in the virtual world, you're in the virtual world, or you can slide the gradient down for opacity and you can just see your real world, but you still see the screens in front of you. Wow. I know, it's just cool. <laughs> Where's Ed and Stuart so they can bash it? Where are they? Where are they? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how often we talk about a minority report and that movie yes. is so old and it's still um such an icon of of, of technology it really it was, was yeah. a great movie it, it it represented a lot of the future interpretation of technology i thought those screens being one of them eye recognition or recognition you know that that is more to reality in more ways than the movie was not from the eye scanning per se but the location based triggering stuff yes. you, you know better than anything now you know back then it was like woo that's really weird it's norm for us now yeah. You know, and, and it would get to the point if it wasn't spooky. It, it, as soon as they get what's called, and they, they actually there was somebody in tech that said this: when they can get omnidirectional speakers, you'll see more minority report engagements. Where you walk into a store and it says "Welcome, Lauren," mm -hmm. because they don't want it to hear but be heard by everybody. They want only you to hear what they're saying. So until they get that monocular, um, uh, singular direction uh, audio capability, that's really one of their trigger points. But yeah, just. Cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, we, I think in the clubhouse conversations, we kind of threw, yeah. Lex, it's easy about it. It's Oculus too. Do buy it. Buy it. <laughs> I spend so many hours on tech support with Google and Microsoft over the past week. 
it made me cry. I mean, almost made me cry. Uh, it's, it's, it can be so frustrating. Technology is so amazing, so liberating, so wonderful. But if you can't get your calendar to work straight, oh. you know. Okay, I, I have one satisfying moment, Adele, just so you know. So being the geek that I am, and you know, I was whining about Google and Apple not working together in the Google Drive. So I go and whatever geek does goes to the chat rooms and Reddit and everything else and read what everybody else is having the same problem of to see what they're doing. I exhausted all of them to the level of frustration that a lot of other tech people were going over saying, it just doesn't freaking work, okay? So I finally went over and contacted my Apple people, which sent me over to somebody from another country. And um, you know they're trying to be very polite and you know they have their script, which we've all had, where it's like, hi, welcome, we're terribly sorry for your inconvenience, sorry. And I said, okay, before we begin, this is what I've done. And they kept trying to interrupt me with, we're terribly, and just, no, no, just listen for a second. <laughs> and I just shotgunned everything I did, all the way down to restarting and reconfiguring my coding and all this other stuff. Thank you very much, hold please. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're not going to talk to him. It was, and they got me, to, and literally, I was told the same thing. Until somebody on either side of the fence blinks and changes something that they're both responsible for, not one side can fix the problem. Apple can't fix Google's issue. Google is having a, it doesn't want to fix Apple's issue. So they're literally just staring at each other from across the field, you know, waiting for the other person to blink. And I'm sitting there going, you know, that's just really pissing off everybody. <laughs> you know, we can't we can't use this thing because it's limiting, as I said, using the sum. Because for me now, I keep everything business wise on Google Drive. That you know, that way I'm not keeping local storage, I'm, and it's also I can secure it for my clients and all this other kind of stuff, encrypt it. So now every time I need to use a file for a client, I got to manually download it to the laptop to use it in what I'm using it for, and then manually upload it via the browser. I mean, I'm like, yeah, no, that's not gonna last with me very long. So I'm stuck using the old laptop that seems to be working because it's only an M1 computer chip issue, not not an Apple software platform issue. It's mm -hmm. how Google plays with M1, because M1 is, it is a much faster chip. It's amazing, the difference in tech on that, but that's a whole other thing. So anyway, <sighs> <I'm not laughs> geek stuff today. <laughs> I won't mention the gaming of the stuff because virtual gaming is a whole, but you know, you can also, and this is where I have to kind of wrestle with my wife on this is um, I introduced her to two things. One, I've started exercising more and there's these exercises on these headsets that are amazing because the instructor is right in front of you in virtual world. Ta-da, hi, follow me, do what I do. And then they do these things where I don't know if you've heard a game called Beat Saber. It's, you have two, okay, Stuart would love this. You have a lightsaber in each hand, basically. Oh God. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so right there, it's a Stewart game. Just saying, it's a Stewart thing. But what it does is the music. These the, you're you're standing on like a rail, a road. Okay, and these boxes are flying towards you that have arrows as to which way you're supposed to strike them. But they're at the tempo of the music, so you're ba ba ba. So you're like almost playing air drums to the. But you're exercising. Very cool concept. <laughs> Put the two together. I'm listening to some tunes I like. I get to beat things up with lightsabers and I'm exercising. <laughs> to me, it's a win, win, win on all level. So anyway, they do this, but this new program called Super, I do the exercises with it. I was on the surface of Mars. They took a, a you know, virtual, they took the pictures of Mars, the 360 pictures of Mars and put you there. So I'm on Mars doing these games and you have to go under the triangles and do all these exercises. Well, my wife, I introduced her to it. So now we wrestle as to who gets to do it first. That was one. Um, then we have these, these um, you can travel anywhere in the world on Google Maps. You know what the, the, the Google Maps? Well, there's high resolution of those. So you can go anywhere in the world by just saying, this is where I want to go. And now you're standing in the middle of the street or standing on the top of the mountain or wherever. You're just there. And you're looking around like, oh, so this is what it looks oh like. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, you can go to Machu Picchu and stuff. They send it up to the International Space Station. Time Magazine and Smithsonian sent it up there at 3D, 360. For two years, it was on the space station. My wife had to have flipped the goggles off because she got claustrophobic because you're literally in the space station. You're there having breakfast with the astronauts and you're in the blister looking down on Earth. You're on a spacewalk with them, a real spacewalk where you're like, holy shit. The other thing I wrestle with her is uh, you can watch Netflix on this anywhere that you know you can be on the surface of the moon watching a big screen in front of you watching Netflix. And of course, you can do it in 3D too, and all this. So now, with that, you know, when there's conflict as to what each of us want to see, guess who goes for the goggles? You know, I'm like, 
And of course, when I go to say, well, let's get this a pair of, no, no, we only have one. It's fine. It's like, no, 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 but you don't let me. Anyway, yeah. And it's an argument you never live and win with, with a wife. It's like, no, I can't buy more tech. It's just you have to share the tech. <laughs> 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 but it is it is amazing stuff. And from a travel perspective, it is. It truly is. I mean, they, they've, there's people, uh, there's a whole community. There's a whole YouTube that people don't know about, which is VR YouTube. And it's, it's it's virtual reality tube. There's a guy that runs around Florida that will take a 360 camera like I have, plop it on on a stand, a little monopod on a beach, and let it run for 30 minutes. And you can just be on that beach for 30 minutes, just wherever the camera. And just if I want to go see San, uh, Sanibel Island, he has a 30 minute video where you're just standing on the beach, looking around. People walk by the camera, or looking at it, or you know, boats are go across. But you're on the beach, sound, everything around, but you know, heat and smell. All right, let's talk about that for just a minute. I'm going to bring this right back to hotel marketing. Watch. Yay! This. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not VR related, but webcam beach yeah. cams are the bomb. For traffic? Oh, yeah. It is amazing how many people just want to sit and look at the beach from their home computer or phone. Mm -hmm. while they're doing whatever it is that they're doing. And I will say this. So we have a, I mean, obviously we have a lot of clients in Myrtle Beach, but also other beach destinations with a lot who have invested in these webcams. And they're just, you know, you can spin them around the outside mm -hmm. of the hotel and they're live shots of Myrtle Beach or whatever. And back in the day, so I'm going back three or four years ago, you would just see this traffic coming in and out and it had a really high bounce rate. And obviously they were just there to look at the beach, but pre just before COVID hit, we really started seeing revenue coming in from people landing on these webcam pages. Like if you look at the lifetime value of these consumers, I'm not talking millions of dollars, but it's more money than they would have gotten had they not had that, you know, dreaming phase. I want to be at the beach to look at while they're, you know, considering their options. There was real money coming in from people looking at these webcams. Yep. Amazing. How much does it cost to set up something like that? That is out of my pay grade. I'm not sure, but I feel like it can't be. It's not actually, uh, I set up webcams for a hotel. Actually, I was, I small claim to fame, The uh, some of the more popular webcams in Key West was from our hotels that I used to run down there that they ended up having to go over in the city one to do it themselves. We ran it off of, at the time, the Westin downtown for Mallory Square. People love watching Mallory Square for Sunset Fest. Since we had the hotel right adjacent to it, I'm like, hey, let's put a webcam up. At the time, cameras were expensive. This goes back a ways, um, 2005, 2006. And they were about a thousand bucks. Now you can get a really decent all weather camera for 250, 300 bucks. And what I do recommend is you do a separate internet line for them. You don't want it to bleak because the brand bandwidth traffic on it when it hit lesson learned from that one way back. Uh, you want your own feed for it. Uh, but if you get a nice, if you get a good, nice gig feed for it, it's well worth the expense. And what I also started doing was lower third banners on the bottom of the uh, cameras for people to be, you know, for more information and so forth um, before Bitly's. Now they have Bitly's, it makes it even easier, or, you know, URL shorteners. Um, you can uh, make, and so you just change the message up. Um, we have people wanting to buy it. When they, oh, that was the other thing too, just as another one. Uh, news feed, news agencies in your market love being able to have tapping into you, your camera. Yes. Sometimes if you're in a really pristine location, they want to put their own camera. We had uh, Jupiter Beach, General, Jupiter Beach Resort. We had the, the two TV stations actually had their cameras, their feeds, their power, their cable, everything to their cameras on our roofs because the view was stellar looking down the beach. And uh, we were always featured every night at 6 p.m. from the Jupiter Beach Resort. Here's the Jupiter Beach. You know, and that went a long way. It's getting some pretty cool traffic. Like, wow, that must be the place to be because, look, there's the beach, you know, so. And I will tell you when weather happens, traffic goes through like hurricane, watch oh, out, like yeah. your network's going down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. People very, are and, fascinated with weather. They want to see what is going on. Yeah, and, and and they stay, you're right, they stay on it. The ski slope cameras too, we did them in Whistler. Um, people love those. And now that's when you start getting something spent. Okay, that whole thing I just saw with cameras, even now, uh, self remote cameras, the the pan and tilts, they're still in the thousand plus range to have, 
and then the software for you to remotely have people use them. Like you have you have a minute that you get to run. You're in a queue. I don't know whether you've ever seen that, but uh, these cameras are pan and tilts and zooms that the remote watcher can control, yeah. and they have a time zone right. that they can do it right. <laughs> And there's a queue of people that are waiting to do that because they want to look at certain things. Or, and, you know, we, 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 in Whistler it was fun because when we had down times, uh, we would make some of the crew uh, sl- uh, ski down the slope because we knew people were really just, because it's one thing to look at the slope and you can't really see the powder or the, how, the, what the snow's like, but you can see the weather. But if they could see somebody ski, they could get a sense of what the snow was looking yeah. like. And so we would shoot down some, and of course they never, oh yeah, really? I'm getting paid to ski? Sure, hey, slap some skis, I'm going, you know? And so they had no problems with that. Um, and and it was always good in that sense that we would show people what the, the powder looked like that day by it's having somebody float yeah. down during the peak, peak traffic. So yeah, you, you know, I think it's, it's fun. It, it, the camera, camera, I'm a geek with the cameras. Um, yeah. I just talked to a guy in Britain um, I'm talking to him about, he does voiceovers, amazing voice. Oh my God, you want him to read the phone book to you. Um, Cause he has that, you know, he's an older gentleman. He has that very distinct uh, uh, British accent, kind of the, like the Royal family accent thing going, you know, proper English, not the, not the Cockney kind of stuff. Where's Ben and Tris when you need them? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, I talked to him a week ago that other than massive apologies, um, they've been going through some pretty heavy lockdowns over there, and mm. also their business is going vertical. <laughs> I mean, good for them. What they're telling me they're engaged with, and what they're being—I tra- mean, they brought back nine people already. No, well, they brought back, they brought nine people they used to work with in other venues to their team. Wow! Oh. So they are okay. scaling like I mean, they get—they get some amazing things going on. We're like, dang! <laughs> but anyway. Um, so this guy, we were talking about the fact this happened uh, in, a, in, you know, the Good News Network. OK, um, I did this for fun. When I was over in, in uh, the Netherlands, I did my 360 camera at my mother-in-law's house where she sits on the couch. And I did it for about 30 minutes because I was inspired by this guy that was running around with cameras. I'm like, just as if you're sitting in her living room for no, you know what I mean? And, 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 and we started looking at it and we enjoyed it for just our own reason afterwards. Cause I did have thinking that, you know, it would be kind of fun to just be with, and it's just fun to just sit, you know, no, TV wasn't on or anything, just sunlight through the window, sitting in the room and, you know, you don't get the smells of anything, but you feel like you're there. So in the good news network, in the nursing homes, they introduced some VR headsets where they put them on people that were uh, unable to travel anymore or to do anything really, they were bedridden. And they allowed them to look around and be anywhere in the world that they wanted to go. And then it hit me and I talked to this guy about it and he, he actually did something like this. Family history, tracing what you've, your family is, the stories you get from people. Uh, he was doing interviews of uh, older people and he got more information from them than their family because some people generationally don't talk about their history and they don't talk about it to their family, but they'll talk about it to somebody else if asked the right questions. And with this voice who wouldn't be like, sure, I'll tell you anything you want. And the dude has an amazing voice. And so uh, he got all this great information that was shared with the, the family. So we started talking about how cool would it be if you put one of these cameras in and you created this dialogue with this family member talking about their lives and remembrance, but with the help of the family, like, we don't know what this picture is, but he may be or she may be. Can you bring this into your questions? Uh, can you talk to them about what did they do when they were during the war or what did they do when this happened? And you know, the family kind of led where you wanted to have some of these questions. He's done that and done interviews with that. And so I was like, well, how cool would it be if in a family reunion, you put one of these cameras in the chair where they usually sat and had the family interact with the camera as if that per- that camera was that person and you saved that and then gave that to them as a gift in return where that person could go over and put the heads on and actually attend a family reunion where the great grandkids are running around or the families around you as if you were sitting there. To me, this is, that's the magic of technology if you can do those things because that's creating some pretty cool stuff, I think. So anyway. That is amazing. But the technology is now. We can do those things now, which makes it so neat. So that's the cool part. So we might that's my contrast to the Google mm-hmm. Apple, Apple pain in my butt thing. So that's my balance act for that. But <laughs> um, anywho's, all right, back to marketing, back to hospitality. Yes. Um, so to, uh, yeah. 
I attended a, a session with Google for that the Hawaii HSMA chapter did. Mm. And uh, I know that uh, Dean mentioned it uh, before in our in our email chat <laughs> before. Yeah. But one of the things that I think we've we've said a lot uh, just in the group before is the first thing they said was embrace agility over certainty, you know, just stop trying to think that things are going to stay put in any certain way. Just embrace the flow and the and 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 focus on your ability to adapt and change. Isn't that life in general? Should right. we just adapt that yeah. for our lives? It should right. be. But you know what, Melissa? I was talking to somebody who was uh, setting up a new business, and you know, they were talking about how focused on the customer satisfaction and the employee satisfaction was going to be, and these are all the things that they put in place. And I said, "Oh, okay. So, what do you have set up for how you will be? Because innovative, 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 innovative was like every other word." And I said, "So, what is your plan for how you're going to in innovate after you open?" I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you know, this is the way, and that's how we're going to do it. And we're sticking to it because we know that this is the best way. Guess what? I mean, what business opens up and right from the get go, they hit it 100% and and they don't need to modify anything or adapt anything. Can you imagine? You have to build that process of um, listening to feedback or, you know, taking in, you know, uh, observations, talking to your team and modifying, 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 don't you think? You know, when actually I was watching CNBC the other day and, oh, I know the letters of the company are XM, which stands for Experience Matters, but I can't remember the name of the company, Qual something. Anyway, uh, the the, the, the lead guy there said he was quoting something or paraphrasing something that the CEO of UPS said was in all of her years of experience in business, she found that the number one most important thing is to listen to your, uh, your customers and your employees mm -hmm. and adapt. So that that ad adaptation, agility, flexibility, I think that that has to be the the guiding light from here on out, don't you Listening think? Listening to your customers, what a novel idea. Well, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I mean, I all the time I I see that there are review responses, guest review responses. Of course, I'm going to talk about that. Guest review responses that are said that they're from the owner. They say that they're from the general manager. And but you can see it's just a cut and paste template right. because it's the same thing for 15 email, uh, 15 messages in a row. Even each time saying that's not the norm. That's not the norm. That's not the norm. That, that's not the norm. Or, you know, I'm so glad that you enjoyed A, B, and C. I'm so glad that you enjoyed A, B, and C. I'm so glad that you enjoyed A, B, and C. And you know what? It would be better if they didn't even do it. Stop even marking that check. If you're just don't even answer better than saying, I'm look how responsible I am. I am. I'm, I'm assigning the night auditor to do. To, mm -hmm. to, to say that they're me right. as if I heard you, you're only pretending that you're listening, but you're not actually listening. That's actually what I was going to ask you. At what point <laughs> is it better to just not respond than to copy paste that looks so fake and and, and consumers know it. They're, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure yeah. that it's the same response. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. Um, you know what? You have to uh, respond to positive and negative, I would say on Expedient Booking.com because it's gonna it's gonna impact your um, ranking in a, in a certain way. They just want to see the uh, the action of putting in a response. And in this case, just say thanks so much for being our guest. Or that's all. 
better to just say that over and over again. Then it's obvious you're not pretending right. that you're actually mm -hmm. making a, a genuine thing. It's just, it's just thank you. And that's it. It's okay to do that for a positive. For a negative, you should never, ever, ever have a template response because you have to have actually made the internal response in your organization before you've attempted to make an external response. The internal response is, hmm, is that so? What can I do to prevent that? You know, I know why we did it that way, but I see that you didn't take it as well as we hoped. So what can I do to change the system so that the next person doesn't feel that way, but I still am doing what I need to do to protect the company, but I'm not over protecting the company so much that I'm hurting the guests. For example, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. You were going to say no, something. no, you bring up a point that, that uh, we've been doing and what I used to do and that we're doing with a couple of clients, but I add a buffer to it where we don't push the GM conversation first. I completely agree with your dialogue between positive and negatives that negatives should never, first off, they should always be genuine for both sides, but in the negatives should have a higher addressed value to it. But we've put in where we respond from a departmental perspective so that we have that extra oomph if it escalates where the GM needs to now step in or the director of ops or uh, somebody of, of a high enough level that, they're, that the guest feels like they're getting the, uh, the authoritative position on it. So most of our dialogues are represented from the sales team, the front desk team, the service team, uh, variations of names, whatever to, what is comfortable for the property, where they're like both positive and negatives. We both hit both of them. Negatives are like, because some of the negatives, and this goes to some of our bot discussion from earlier in the week, are, are logistic things like my billing was off or uh, I had a service issue. And rather than throw the kitchen sink of the GM coming back, oh my gosh, this was this, we did this or whatever, it was more of the service manager getting back to them so that if they could resolve it from a simple dialogue of we're sincere, you know, for always approach it with, obviously it's an issue, it's your issue, so it becomes our issue, we're gonna take on this, whatever, um, that they feel like it's being addressed. Should they feel that isn't satisfactory, that they didn't talk to the big enough person to make their point, at least we can pull that card out at the end going, okay, great. Well, here's the GM to answer your questions, but we don't just throw the GM first. And it's helped us mitigate where we're not looking so fake. I mean, that's probably why I'm bringing it up is that that whole generic box can kind of responses. We're literally coming off as department type people. And then for the GM to step in is really a stroke of the pen. Like, Hey, this is, this is us, you know? So. Okay. So if that works and that's, and and that's fixing the problem, not just resolving that instance for that one person. Then right. that's right. But the here's here's a viewpoint from someone who had the number one hotel in the world on TripAdvisor in 2017, <laughs> and 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 the number uh, often several of the hotels would be on the top 25 for for TripAdvisor year after year on. Um, on the Traveler's Choice Awards. So instead, consider this approach, if it works. It is, if you are, if it's taking too much time or a drain to, to answer positives, you don't really need to ha answer the positives because the positives spoke for themselves. And when somebody's reading reviews, they, are looking to hear what other travelers had to say. They're not really looking for it to hear from you. You're missing an opportunity to uh, sell your hotel a little bit because you can throw in, oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed the restaurant. Guess what? We're, you know, get, we're opening the outdoors. So when you come back again, it's going to be even better blah, 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 whatever, something like that, or changing the menu, or, or next time you come back, there'll be a vegetarian menu. I'm always talking about that, but getting back to what you were, say, were saying, leaving it to the department head limits the creative juice on how to innovate to keep that that review or that, that response, um, or I'm, I should say, whatever that friction point was, 
it, you're limiting your creativity. When you look at it from a full, uh, a more full rounded approach, when you have someone from the front desk and housekeeping and the, and the manager and somebody from marketing, and I say always have somebody from sales and marketing on the team that is looking at how that response is is going to be answered because you're not just responding to that one thing you're making you're taking the spark of an idea or you're looking for a spark of an idea of how you can make things better forever and always for all your future guests and the marketing department they know how that impacts maybe what they put in the pre-stay email what did they put on the booking engine the the pictures how they would address that in pictures how they would address what's on the website or how they phrase something in an ad that maybe gave a false impression that it was going to be this way, but it's really going to be that way. There are things that the, the sales and marketing understand on that side that sometimes it's just a communication issue and they can solve that. And the front desk can't solve that and they won't even think in that in those terms. So they can't come up with that solution without including that sales and marketing person at the table. And the the general manager can also not singularly on their own think of a solution on, on everything himself or herself. Uh, they need the front office person that was involved or the reservations person that was involved. They needed somebody in the sales. And you should have somebody who's in higher management and really knows the whole operation really well. But you should also have someone young and new to the organization, but pretty savvy, who's creative. And because they'll say, well, but why do we do it like that? Well, we've always been doing it like that, so we always do it like that. Don't, don't you think we should always do it? No. Why, why did you ever do it like that? Wouldn't you do it like that? Sometimes they can cut through the history of, of something that we did pre, pre-computers <laughs> and okay. just think it's not needed anymore. Okay. I am going to tassel with you a little bit. Okay. I love it. <laughs> I hear on one side that the need for us to be adaptive and change what that really translates to do. You're talking from a very traditional bandwidth capable program uh, on how to respond. I totally agree with you that there are times that resources need to be collaborated with so that the messaging, first off, brand quality, being the tech geeky head I have, there are, are there, there are technologies now that allow for author authorization gates that something doesn't go out until it gets approved. So there's technologies that help with the fact that we don't have the random, I'm pissed this evening response from a night auditor that happens to be asked to do something in particular, that it has to hit a gate to make sure like, oh, hell no, we're not gonna say that. And we're gonna do this. And we're not gonna use that kind of, you know, with that picture or whatever it is. <laughs> I do say, however, and this is from a scale of size and volume, and I have a client in particular, in New York actually in particular, if the GM responded at the level that you're talking about for good and bad, they think that the GM literally sat all day and did nothing but this because the flow was a torrent. It was thousands of comments, reviews, conversations per week. Let's just be general. Yeah. There's no way without it looking fake that the GM could answer those things. Just can't. And so it was, this is where it was born from, to be honest with you. Uh, well, actually I did before, but then I brought it into this is that by having a lot of the content, and I think Tamari pointed out, sometimes it's just, it is accounting questions or it is a billing issue and they're complaining about the billing issue. Okay, so it is a legitimate review. Guys, your billing issues are screwed. I can't get a receipt or I can't get this or I can't get my refund. If there's a logistics issue to it. Having the front line of people that are depend departmentally responsible for that type of engagement is a good first step for a lot of what I feel is to be strong authoritative, giving them the power, because you've brought this up before, Adele, that give them power, give them the power to make these things happen, okay? With the caveat from a management's perspective, the oversight of authorization and brand consistency. You don't want renegade conversations, you don't want renegade perspectives, and you don't want inconsistent voice mm -hmm. responses. You don't want, well, that's somebody different than answered that one, because that's not what that person said, and it's supposed to be the same company. So I yeah. say- you, yes, I completely agree the success what you've had profound and all that works. But I think also from an adaptive point of view, the bandwidth isn't there in the hotels to have a rally about how we're going to review. I, I truly believe in the perfect world, 
everyone should get together once a week and see what everybody's talking about them. Absolutely. You've mentioned that many times. It, that's probably one of the most strongest things you can ever do is like, let's see what people really think about what we're doing here and re read the reviews to the team or have the team read the reviews. But right now, when I deal with properties, they are totally, I mean, look, dude, I'm pulling 80, 90 hour shifts this week. I don't have time to uh, marketing. Are you freaking kidding me? As a matter of fact, shut the damn thing off. I, ca I can't handle what it, you know, that's what I'm dealing with is from these property people. If you start talking to them about sprinkling sunshine, they're going to go over and they're going to tell you what to do with the sprinkling sunshine component. <laughs> but I mean, and I mean, I'm not trying to be mean about it. I'm just it, They're just so back in your face. Like you are so out of touch with my world right now is basically what they're telling me. You are, you have no concept. I'm worried about plunging a toilet here in about two seconds and a housekeeper that didn't show. And I got five rooms to turn and burn before they show up today. And that's already selling at 50% my occupancy because such and such decided to get a test or such and such didn't get a test and they got COVID or whatever it is. That's my world. Don't talk to me about how much money I need to spend on a marketing campaign. Cause to be honest with you, bud, I don't have any interest. In but I'm not talking about a marketing campaign. And no, I'm, no, but, and I'm but not the idea about... of the review process that you're talking about is as unrealistic is probably my point. I'm just saying that that's, that's, in their sense right now, that, that collaboration, cooperation, centralization just doesn't work in a lot of their environments right now. But you know what? And, and, and I, you know, I understand that. I totally understand that. And if that's the way it is, if you have to cut something, cut responding to the positive reviews, certainly on TripAdvisor that where your response on a positive review does not contribute to your, your ranking. It does on Expedia. So just be straight about it and just say, thanks so much for being our guest. That you know, see, uh, We hope to see you again. Just leave it at that. Nobody's expecting more. But if you're going to pretend that it's a sincere response, don't do it. So then now you don't have to worry about that. And you only have to worry about the, the complaints. And the reason that I say it's worth the time and it does. You don't have it to oh, sleep yeah. in the same room. You just get on the call. Say, "Hey, let's have a quick chat about this. This is what happened. What do you guys think? It, it, it is I think that there might be a nugget of truth to this. How can we approach it better? You tell me how we're going to do it moving forward." And the GM, when I say the GM is 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 should be in that conversation because they should know how their operation is going. I, they should mm -hmm. know what people are saying about them. They should not be in blindfolded because nobody's letting the GM actually see what's, what's going on. And then let that de uh, department head say, hey, this is what I think. And, and let the marketing person in on the conversation because they may contribute something to it. They, in a completely different way than anybody else will see it and know that there's something more that needs to be added or that it needs to be said a certain way. And then once you've decided what you're gonna do internally, you the GM doesn't have to write it. The Whoever is capable of writing a compassionate, literate um, response that will attract customers to your door, if it's, I mean, unless you don't care if you have more customers coming to your door, unless you don't care if that negative review is going to, um, you know, keep other people from from coming. No, back. no. It, I mean, it doesn't. I mean, I'm, I'm, please listen. I agree with everything you're saying. I'm I'm being an advocate on something. I'm pulling an ed today in some senses with that, I guess. But in all honesty, and I mean this, and from my example of the marketing idea, I literally have properties that tell me to shut up. <laughs> I have no interest in marketing right now. I don't want more people. I hear you. They are burnt, fatigued, dead. They don't really, at this point, they realize, and 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 what you're doing is you're being like UP, uh, like uh, uh, yeah, UPS. They don't have dirty trucks because they made it important not to have dirty trucks. And I know it sounds like a really what the hell is he talking about? It's true. When they're rustling, they're running around like fiends, and they got a trailer attached to the back, and it's Christmas season, and they don't have enough people to actually throw enough boxes on enough doorsteps because they're so overwhelmed with demand, like they were this past Christmas. The last thing you they, they'd be worried about is keeping their trucks clean. UPS decided, said, "No, I'm sorry, we will not drive around somebody's neighborhood with a crappy ass looking truck that's all mudded out and dirtied out. We will always have the shiny clean trucks because that's what we are. That's you, Adele. That's you saying, hey, out of all this stuff." 
We have to be listening to our guests. We have to be listening to what we're doing right or wrong. It's important for us because even though you're knee deep into the hoopla right now, we need to make sure that we're doing good business through that whole entire process. I completely, my reality is, is that we have a lot of people that are one hair breath away from going, yeah, you, I'm out of here. You know, they're done. And we've already seen people in our industry that have already made that choice going, you know what, this ain't worth it. And then we get a lot of other people going, I ain't going back to it until I have a reason to make the money that they're not, they're barely offering me to go do this. I'm going to look for other opportunities. And that's the, the crisis we're in. Your points are well-founded. You're Truly, everything you're saying, if we don't have our good sensitivity to our guests, if we don't do all these things, we don't have those things in place. The, the, the logistics is what I'm contesting is at this point, a reevaluation of how we address what we're doing. And you made a very good point. Positives don't influence what you need to worry about as much as, the, as addressing the negatives for perception and reality of what we need to correct for and make that the focus. And no, the GM doesn't always have to be the one. I'm just saying that in some circumstances, it, it might have to be a shorter line between point A, point B, and how things get facilitated as long as it's still being overseen. You know, that that whole maybe yeah, it is yeah. the front of the person that answers. The, the the GM never, ever, I, I, I have not seen situations where the GM is actually composing the words on the on the page or, or typing it in. But um, you know what? Focusing on a mission as a team and letting everybody have some skin in the game makes them more aware during their day of how important it is the way they treat people. Whether it's just, you know, smiling, I guess, when they arrive can be just enough and making that person feel really welcome may be just enough to not have complaints at the hotel. Even if something went wrong, they were greeted so graciously, they were, they felt cared for, and okay, so something went wrong. So I'm just gonna. I, I'm not worried about it. But if, but if the GM or if just the night auditor is the only person who's looking at them and just plopping away things, it's so fake. And it and or if even if just the account like the accounting guy or the front office manager is doing it on his own, it's not impacting the team. It it has to be that everybody knows this is. This is what we want to achieve. We want to be great. We want to make sure everybody's happy. And and when somebody isn't, we listen to them and we make judgments according. We we make um, modifications accordingly, not to hurt the company, but that protects the company. But and also and also takes care of the guest. Mm -hmm. That means that you're going to have less problems to deal with. You know what's heartbreaking for the staff? What will that it time sucking for the staff? You know what's taking their time? Dealing with problems. If you stop having the problems or you diminish the problems greatly, you have more time to do other things and you feel better about your job and you stop looking for other other careers because you're getting, I'm so tired of dealing with complaints every day and nobody seems to do anything to change it. So I'm just going to do something else because I, I, I've, I've lost my strength. If you have, if you have many, many, many complaints, it's taking your time. If you have fewer complaints it, and, and you have a positive way of dealing with them, it's not it's not sucking your time and energy away. It's just, hey, here's an opportunity. How, how can we make things better? And people feel good about it when they're drowning in complaints and dealing with them every day. It's it's a it's soul crushing. True. OK, well, I'm, I'm not trying to take it away from you, but I, I, I don't I, I'm going to take the privilege of having Melissa with us. <laughs> I'm just looking at some of Robert's stuff while we we're talking to. So I was, I, was yeah. I, mean, I think we made some great points, but by all means, and did, but, but I'm going to go over and ask if Melissa has a favorite conversation, because I'm just reading the. I had a suspicion on something and the article just reaffirmed it uh, from what Robert sent over. So I was just going to. I actually just want to stick on the reviews for just like one minute. Go ahead. I, know. Go ahead. I just want to make sure you. I'm going, going off on a tangent. Though. I'm, <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent on this one. 
I have not spent, because I literally have zero time on my hands to do this, but I haven't spent time on TripAdvisor anywhere else, really looking through reviews lately, knowing that everybody's understaffed at this point. And I'm wondering what percentage of reviews are specifically calling out definitely shortage of staffing issues and how those are being addressed. So I had a, I had a call with a client yesterday. I asked them flat out, I was like, are you guys like everybody else and understaffed and what are you guys doing? And they're like, yeah, we're completely understaffed. We can't get enough people. We're outsourcing. We've got multiple staffing agencies. We've never had to do this before. And I said, okay, uh, given that number one, how are you handling your rooms? Have you, are you not selling all your rooms? How are you handling it? And they're like, well, no, we're not closing off any rooms, but we've raised our rates. You know the story, blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay. And they said that, you know, we're just offering trash and, and towels on a daily basis for housekeeping. I said, have you notified your customers before they get there so they know what to expect. And I was happy to hear the response that yes, it is in multiple pre-arrival emails, it's in the confirmation, you know, once they make the booking, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yay, check for a client doing what they're supposed to be doing. But I'm wondering how, what percentage of hotels are really doing that so that people don't leave those negative reviews I've, I've seen exactly what you're saying, uh, where things were closed or services were limited and they they still paid full price and they were not told in advance what to expect. And people will understand if you tell them what to expect. Of course, I think a lot of people are saying, OK, but now, you know, now that it's a resort and it's full and and you're you're charging me you're not charging more. Me they're prices. charging me more than you ever have and yet you're you're you still not bringing it back yeah. i mean you can't have a full breakfast but i can go across the street to a restaurant and have a full breakfast but not in the hotel it doesn't make it doesn't make sense to some people and 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 fair enough but yes uh, there are still cases of that happening now where they're and and maybe it's because it's so fluid that uh hotels are tired of changing it and changing it i don't know i just i my hope is that they just understand that these expectations need to be set early yes. on and it would alleviate so many of those negative reviews because i think yeah. at least you tell people what is going on they're certainly more likely to be more understanding yeah well, okay. because i mean I let's face it we are not a normal leisure traveler i think most americans while they hear that oh everything's open again or a lot of things are open again unemployment rates are going back down again they don't realize that hospitality can't get their workforce back mm -hmm. to them you know everything is going back to normal so i think there's got to be an education to the consumer about this yeah well i do know that um responding to reviews is something that can be outsourced but i would just say only only positive reviews i i would never let somebody else speak for me on a negative review Okay, so I'm going to try to act like I'm brilliant on this. Where I brought up the Google Apple thing, um, I think what we have is a different. What we have, we have is a failure to communicate. I think we as travelers are going in <coughs> with a chip on our shoulder. Aren't you thankful I'm here? And the hoteliers who are burnt, toasted, and fried are thinking, "Aren't you happy I'm in, still in business?" And you got a lot of both self-thinking people of you know what. This is what we have. Be thankful we have it. And you have a lot of people be thankful I'm here. Why don't you have what you're charging me for? And it's going like this in a lot of ways. Uh, I think we talked about on the show a, a couple of months ago, actually. I, I brought up the idea that we have to get our teams well trained in the fact that we're going to have very, some very angry people because aspirationally and anticipation of when I finally make that this is my first trip thing. 
I got a lot riding on that. I, 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 this is a buildup for me. It's like, you know, not to talk about, it's like first date stuff, you know, it's like, Hey, <laughs> this is a big deal. Um, and so going there and then the coffee that was for free in the lobby isn't there or it's empty and I go ballistic on it. Uh, you know, my team or the team at the hotel has to realize it may not be about the coffee at all. It may be about this is just the last straw of yet more stuff that that person has been disappointed with by the time that I get to them and try to solve their world's problems. To Adele's point, that's our focus. Hey, I don't know why you're mad, but it's my job to make sure that I can do whatever I can to not make you mad or to find a way to make it better for you if it's in my power to do so. Yeah. With the caveat being, I have limitations too. I can't solve world peace. Okay, so... I can make sure the coffee gets filled and can apologize all day long that you were the unfortunate soul that found it empty. But at the end of it, that's all I can really do for you. I can't give you your room for free for a week just because the coffee ran out. Sorry, it's not going to happen. You know. But if we stop, but if we start with an with sharing a a goal and a vision and an expectation for our team of you know what, you guys are wonderful. I can give you lots of examples of how well you're wonderful because I can see all these wonderful um, reviews that have been written. Even if you you have a, a lot of terrible reviews, you still have a lot of five-star reviews probably as well that you can say, look, look, you can do this. You can do this. And let's all do it together and let's support each other and be humble you know, you were saying before, Lauren, about you should just be grateful I'm here. Well, I'm so sorry, but no business should be, you should just be grateful I'm here. I agree that's with you, but that's the probable yeah. reality of it. There are people, yeah. that, because remember, those people who rent the hotel don't own it. They're not getting the derived benefit of the fact the business is operating. They're getting a paycheck. And yeah. after a certain 80 or 100 hour week for the sixth, seventh and eighth month, no vacation, no breaks, no nothing. And they have to cover from when everybody is sick and that you get in this martyrdom complex. And, and from that, you get this intolerance going on. And yes, it's toxic. And yes, I'm not condoning it. It's just a reality of overstressed, overworked people in any environment. They get where they've lost their reason for value mm -hmm. other than the fact that they you know, are getting paid or whatever it is. It's, not, it's just a reality that, that some staffers, especially if they don't do what you say, which is being involved and being engaged and being supported and being uh, uh, given empowerment to do things and so forth, get to the intolerance of it is what it is. Yeah. Okay. I but can't can the help world for you. you know, and they get that attitude. It's just, hey, be glad that you still have a place to come to. It's, it's an unfortunate circumstance, but uh, you get it in restaurants, you get it in retail. I'm not saying we have a monopoly on this. I mean, there's stores that are like, be thankful I'm still here. You guys haven't shown up for a year and, and, you know, I'm still able to squeeze a penny to make sure the door opens, you know. It's just a reality of some of these people's perspectives that will get past. But the good ones have done things like you talk about. There's like, hey, look, we're all in this together. We really need everyone's insight and input, input and so forth. To flip this just a little bit, I don't want to do it all just by reviews, but um, that's also very responsive. We're not being as proactive. And I say this, I love the fact that Robert had thrown out his newsletter and the Expedia one is something that I have been suspicious of because I watched it with Airbnb. I've watched it with VRBO. And now Expedia is doing the same thing. And that is they're personalizing the purpose of travel. They're, 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 they're focusing in on what makes travel enjoyable and why they're the choice to make for it. Uh, Airbnb is my example. If you may have already seen the commercials, they're talking about being able to bring your pet. How cool is it to bring your friends together that finally get vaccinated and hang out in a space that you don't have to share with anybody else? Your big old living room, bring your dogs. There's a pool you can make them swim in if you want to try it. You know, that thing. Okay. And, and then VRBO did the same thing. And now Expedia, as the article pointed out, I'll throw the link up for the article, sorry, um, is all about they're putting their chips in the middle of the table on this. They're doing one of the largest ad campaigns they have run in five years. That's pre-COVID by far, hmm. okay, of an effort to re because Expedia is a content machine, and there hasn't been a whole lot of content. There's a lot of regurgitated content over and over and over for a lot of stuff, but it's not a whole lot of content. And so they're needing people to travel to validate the value proposition of what they're marketing about. And so they're talking about all chips in, biggest budget in five years. And it's all about personalization of travel. Not personalization is what I pick and choose, 
the value of why I'm traveling for what I want to do with whom I'm traveling with. And they showed some campaign examples in the article about it's not be me by myself. It's who I travel with. So it went from the focus of where you're going. It went from the focus of where you're staying to the focus of why you're traveling and who you're doing it with, which in its way is brilliant. Gosh, those guys are smart, you know, because it's the same track that Airbnb and VRBO went with. It's not about where and how, you know, it's, it's about why the, the, the stuff. Start well, with why. Hmm? Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Start with why, you know, like the book. Yeah. Simon Sinek says. yeah, right. Start with why. <laughs> why is it this way? And, and they did a great job of it. And when we talk about reviews and so forth, that is a response reflect. You know, that's a you 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 have proactiveness in how you respond to this information and in turn how you adapt to make sure it doesn't go into a negative response. As I often said, there's always two problems to uh, there's two issues to a problem, the current solution and the future solution. How, solving the issue now, and then how do you learn from it so that it doesn't reoccur again, if it's possible? So that's a reaction kind of thing. Response reviews are reaction kind of things. You learn and adapt from them, but they're going to the front of the line. They're going over and saying, we're going to talk to you about the things that make it valuable for you to make these types of decisions. They, who are you going to go with? Why are you going to go with them? If that's the case, we have lots of options of where you think you might want to go do this. So they're really going farther up the, the stream in their dialogue. They're not talking about here's room and rates, here's destination information, here's what you want to know about us, or even one step earlier going, this is what we think you should be interested in. They're actually going farther up the river and going over and saying, so who are you traveling with? What you want to do? They're going uh, high, They're going into the Google-esque world of, okay, that's the aspirational discovery. You know, what, if it's, what are you thinking about here? So anyway, I can see uh, Melissa's reading. For, for I'm me. trying to read. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to watch the video of James Corden. I, I love that man. I would watch oh, he's him carry he? 24 he's hours a day if I could. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he is brilliant. He, he has a, a really neat delivery. Uh, there's just people that, that uh, and I give Tim Peter actually credit for this as well. Uh, I, I will always to the day is long be a marvel of uh, Tim running a, a panel on a stage. He's a person that without adding his content to it, which is something I can't not do. I mean, I'll be like, my opinion is he's the opposite of that. He is the solicitor of dialogue without actually having to preface it. You know, he just brings it out of people and I'm just in awe like, that is a skill I do not have. He just is one of those people that says something and the person goes off in a direction that he wanted them to go. And I just, I'm totally impressed by that all the time. And to the point, he, he does the same thing. It's like he gets solicitation of dialogue that isn't because he said, let's talk about this. It's he created the circumstance that made the person talk about it. I just think it's brilliant. I really do. It's one of those, like you respect it from afar. It's like uh, Jay Hubs. Jay Hubs is another guy I respect. He can listen to somebody and deal with people that I would be like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I mean, I just, I have no tolerance for some people that are self important, totally dominated. This is their thing. I'm sitting there going, no, I have to poke the tiger. I have to poke the tiger. You're too arrogant. You're too self centered. He's kind of one of those persons that just picks his time. And I'm like, wow. Me, no. Uh, my heart's on my sleeve and my opinion's in my mouth. It's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Did you ever notice? A, sorry, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say. Speaking of self-aware and self-arrogant people, I have to go meet with Stuart in person. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go record an episode of the podcast in person again. This is our second week in a row of seeing each other face to face after a year. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, he said you guys did the first podcast uh, in person last time. So yes, this is our second one. What topic did we get to the first one? Did she listen to your podcast? Was it tomorrow that I asked you that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, you're, you're famous. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not famous. <laughs> oh, so yeah. It, was, I mean, it is, a, it is a, a brilliant podcast. You guys have amazing functional information. And you guys have it in an amazing format, too, because you keep it interesting just to promote the hell out of you about it because it is a brilliant Thank podcast. You. It's a multi-award winning podcast. Two times. Two times. Both. No, every time you've applied for an award, you've won it. Just think about it. Just We have a 100% win rate. Yes. 100% win rate on your award <laughs> status for your podcast. Yes. But, but it is one of those things that I have seen it where 
you know, Stuart has been in the conference and somebody's like, oh, you're Stuart from the podcast. I've seen it. I've seen the fanboy. The, 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 yeah, the, the, I've seen it happen. So, yes. And I, I give credit to you, not him for that. It's like, you know, it wouldn't be near as smart if Melissa wasn't there. I'm just saying. <laughs> He's a um, rocket scientist, though. I mean, literally. So, you know. I yeah, we are. But he throws credit. it around a little too much. I think he just worked on some secondary rocket stuff. I don't think uh, he was on the primary fuel consumption thing. <laughs> That's a rocket science. When you're doing fuel <laughs> consumption ratios, then you're a rocket science. Right then, up to that point, you're a valve controller, you know. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, just not rocket scientist, too. But, no. Um, well, please say hi to Stewie for me. Um, I will. I thought I don't bug him enough over the course of the week anyway, but it's always fun to bug him. I've been trying to push that whole VR thing with him, given, you know, his need for vi visuals as much as he does, because it is close to the eyes and stuff. But, uh, but Ed tried it and he ended up selling the headset because he got motion sickness. Oh, wow. Whoa. Interesting. You know, there is, and it is, I mean, when you're there, you're there. I mean, virtually and, and, uh, there's, you can do it standing up where you put a little zone around you to, uh, uh, you know, make sure you don't run into things in your real world. I do it sitting in a spinny chair because I'm lazy. And also I'd fall over. I try to stand up for too long doing some of the stuff I do, but either way it's, it, you are very much in it and you do the roller coaster stuff or the flying stuff. And I, not that I maybe have done it a couple of times or fell out of my chair, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is very, very uh, engaging. Yes. So yes. But anywho, well, Melissa, thanks for jumping in and uh, uh, you know have fun with the podcast. What's what's the topic you guys are going to record on? So we can get a sneak peek. Oh, we in. are talking about differentiating your hotel so it stands out. Mm. That's a good one. That yeah, is a good one because it's also yeah, it, that's that's a good one. Okay, <laughs> have to listen to it. Not that I don't already listen to them all already, just. I'll make sure. Yeah. Now, when is that going out next week, or, or when are you guys? I going believe it should be published next week. Yes. Which episode is it now? What number are you guys on now? I have no idea. That's Stuart's job to keep up. One hundred and eighty something. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep up with numbers. I, I'm lucky. I remember like my birthday at this okay, point. That's really weird for you to say that. I'm just saying because you are the numbers person. I know. I know, but there's so many numbers crammed in there that there's no room left for anything. Yeah, else. I try to tell my wife that too. She just gives me the look of like, no, you just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 it's just so much stuff in there and she's like yeah useless stuff <laughs> anyways all right well for people that do want to find this podcast we're talking about where do they go fueltravel.com slash podcast you can find all things related to fuel you can find me on linkedin or on clubhouse if you have an apple device and i'm happy to connect with anybody who's interested now, you guys going to do a separate club room? Uh, I mean, I know that you, I have the privilege of you jumping on ours, so you know, but I mean, you guys going to start doing your own room or anything like I that? I see that in the near future. It's a lot of time. It's Gotta a lot of time. You. It's a lot of time. <laughs> it's good it time. I have, learned, I have learned more in the past month from these clubhouse rooms than I yeah. have in my entire career. I'm not even yeah. Yeah. It is amazing listening to, I mean, there are some brilliant, and, and you're always very surprised by sometimes the people that are in the room. Yes. You know, you'll you look at quick bio and you're like, you own how many what? You know, you just look at it as like, <laughs> wow, okay, sure. And and then you get some amazing, uh, um, well, who's that guy that does the stats that was also, he he jumped in with us. Amir. In Amir, oh. I don't remember his last name, but it's first yeah, I know it was me, yeah, right. Amir. Huh? Amir Elan, is it that? No, I don't, he, I don't know. He he does he does a lot of. Um, I think he's with an agency as well, isn't he? And he does a lot of uh, data work as well. When he first started talking, and I'll be honest with you, I got a little bias on the fuel travel side because as soon as somebody started talking, well, I've done this survey stuff. I'm like, oh really? Have you now? Well, I have. No, it was know, a good uh, study. You know. It was a good survey. Yeah, it was. I, yeah, I, I think it was Amir Elan. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he it was really good data. Yes, he's, he speaks exceptionally well and uh, good content. Every time he pops in the room, I'm always like, oh, I want to try to drag him up on stage because he's really good like that. But yeah, it, 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 it's neat how the many people you're running into, but it can be a huge black hole for time. I mean, because yeah, you're just like, oh, I don't want to leave now because without it being recorded, if you're not there, you're not there. It's, a, it's right. a, you miss whatever the dialogue is and it changes like this. I mean, we do it in our own room where we're talking about one thing and then two minutes later, it's a whole different topic. And then somebody will pop in, this guy Rob popped into the room a few days ago 
and just totally took it in an amazing direction. We're like, wow, was that insightful? You know, like a little golf cap in the back. Like, yeah, you probably, you know, just good stuff. But anyway, you got to run. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I put ah. a, a link from some stats from Amir uh, in the in the. Chat. It might be okay. So it is the same one, yeah. He's a really nice guy and really speaks well. And and uh, yeah, it just it was it was neat to run across him. But oh, how's your room doing? In in, in uh, I I I I was um, like a guest host in uh, somebody else's room yesterday. It <laughs> I I I really want to focus my time on something that I'm having trouble really getting as far with it as I'd like to. So I'm I'm trying not to get too caught up in the in the club room more than once a week. And you know when Stuart and Ed talk in the morning at eight a.m. I could listen to them while I'm walking, but I found that it's too irresistible to want to contribute something. <laughs> and then I have, and I'm outside, and there's the wind and everything, and I'm yeah. out of breath because I'm going like this. So I sound like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it changes the clubhouse in a whole different direction. Nobody is like, well, now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's that kind of room we're in, is it? Yeah. Uh, we, we do have some people. Uh, it is fun because some people do, of course, it's like a podcast in this sense or radio show you're listening to that you just listen to it. But it does allow the affordability that if, if it is allowed by the people moderating it to say, hey, it's open forum, come on up, that you don't in some ways at one point go over and say, wait a minute, uh, no, or I want to say something about that. And you catch people in some some pretty amazing background noises. Like you can definitely tell when they're driving. You can definitely tell when there's family around and or pets uh, or when they're outside and they're trying to like cover from the wind, but it's hard to hear them anyway. But they're so inspired by the conversation, which is the best, biggest compliment you can get is that they're so engaged with what you're talking about that they felt compelled, regardless of what was going on around them, to join the conversation. And everybody that I've introduced it, because, you know, it's by invite only for those unfamiliar with Clubhouse. It's an iOS only platform app right now, which I, I think is silly, but also in a quasi way brilliant because it is making it even that more exclusive as to whom for now. It makes it more lucrative. To like, oh, I'm on it. Uh, they're still doing the invite thing. So you have to be invited into the platform. You can obviously ask to be invited and they can tell you, hey, you joined, which I think there's, there's no real strong gateway to that. Um, but I've sent out some advice to people with the caveat, as we just said, hey, guys, it's a time, just, you know, it's it's a very engrossing because there's a room about everything. It's like a, it's like the old version. Remember when chats first came out way back, like late 90s, you know, it's like the chat rooms where people and you didn't know what was going to go on. And there was some conversations like you didn't want to know what was going on. Like, oh, no. No, 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 we're done. We're done. We're not going to go there. Um, but it, it has that kind of uh, it's virility of chasing and talking and so forth, which, you know, we've always done on this show uh, with the medium that we have. And Clubhouse is kind of that on the audio only version of it in a lot of ways, too. But I, 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 as much as I applaud them not re allowing you to record it, it's bum because we've had some brilliant it's conversations. It, it's so frustrating. I I would love to listen to it at a later time, mm -hmm. like maybe just before bed or when I first wake up, but I'm not getting out of bed yet, and I just want to sit there and listen, or I'm sitting out on the patio. That would be really good to listen to it afterwards, and it, then I don't have to be tempted to join the conversation. Right. Or if if, if there were two things that I would change, in addition to having it recorded or having the option of it can be recorded. I would make it possible for somebody to join without actually showing up if they don't want to and just listen without without going, oh, Adele is here. Hey, Adele, don't you want to come up? No, <laughs> maybe I do, maybe I don't. And then number two is sometimes I want to just be able to to put something in the chat like I can when I'm watching a show like this. And mm -hmm. if I'm watching a broadcast that's happening at the moment, something live on LinkedIn, I can put chats in and I can feel every bit as part of the conversation as if I was on the stage and I don't have to, you know, I can do, I, I really love that. I can't stand the fact that I can't chime something in just by, mm -hmm saying a few words on the side. 
Yeah, it, it there is a good and a bad to it in that sense, and 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 yes, it did. It, each channel has its medium of value, and, and and I think Clubhouse for me. I mean, I can listen to podcasts and do listen to podcasts all the time, and you can see the importance of podcasts in a variety of ways in the past year and plus. Is you have almost everybody that's in the news medium has their own podcast. Every TV show has its own podcast now. Uh, everybody has that as an alternative channel for people. Now Clubhouse comes along, and it's a engagement podcast. It's kind of like the old radio station asking things, hey, Doc, uh, listeners, call up and, and, and join the conversation kind of thing. Um, so it has this engagement possibility. But the other caveat is if you're not on the show, you don't get to participate and or also hear what was said. Um, so you know we're going to be launching the channel next week the hospitality marketing channel uh, where these shows are now going to be broadcasted on uh, Roku, Apple TV and um, Amazon prime, you know, King, you know, fire sticks or whatever and Google uh, as a subscription service so that people can actually watch these things. Um, I can't record clubhouse because violation policy. I, I think it's brilliant that they have them, but what I've started doing now is recapping my clubhouse in my podcast as well uh, because some great content comes out of them. I have to paraphrase it, obviously, and put it in context into the storyteller is the tale mm -hmm. uh, in my perspective of how I thought it valuable. But at least it doesn't get to be lost content outside of the dialogue of the people that were there. Um, and, but there's been some incredibly good insights, uh, some incredibly good um, results. I mean, Amy, the one that Stuart keeps touting around, that went over and saw that there were people coming into their hotel all the time to stay to get uh, vaccinations because they couldn't get it in New York or larger cities. And they're going upstate to do it. And she went and reached out to the local news media and then she took, got featured in the news and amplified the business even more, you know, and that literally came out of a dialogue that Stuart and, and, and Ed were having at the 8 a.m. about it, about media and then and, and being sensitive to, to being able to use them and leverage them and so forth. So it's been very interactive for a lot of people uh, in, in, yeah. in, as another platform. So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. On that. yeah. Um, couple of things. I know that Robert sent out the list late, which is, you know, thanks, Robert, for doing the list. Uh, it makes it hard to go over and say, hey, look at this great article. And nobody's looked at it yet. It's like, where is that article? Um, but uh, it does lend some of the things we talked about earlier about adaptability and so forth. Tim had his article, which we shared. Yeah. Um, Robert has more articles about those things that we, we share to it as well. But I think one of the, the other aspects of this week that's come through on the chat rooms as well has been this we got to stop coaching and just start letting the the, the team play the game um, we talk about all the adaptabilities that we need but we're talking about it around it uh, we're talking about all the things that you couldn't think about doing but there, there's not a lot of action going on um, the reality of it I mean I was being very pragmatic in our discussion about burnout and so forth is just to pull the pendulum the other way a little farther. Um, but there is also the fact that there is real decisions being made. Like, to be frank, do they hire a me or a you? Uh, do they hire a revenue manager? Do they hire a marketing person? Do they hire a sales person? Or because of this relocation, reevaluation is the first financial decision, okay, uh, third party, because we talk about labor uh, a lot these past couple of weeks and raising salaries and or raising hourlies are long term decisions. You can't tell somebody, hey, I gave you a, a raise three months ago because I really need you to hang around. Now they don't need you to hang around as much. I got to bring your salary back down. That conversation doesn't happen. Or but if people it is, are giving bonuses. Yeah. So there's incentive purchases like, hey, signing bonuses and or performance bonuses and or carrots on the end of the stick for people to go over and do stuff with. Um, what's Robert saying? You never look at the articles when I send them earlier either. It's the of the show. <laughs> You're right, Robert. We ignore you at all levels. No. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the financial decisions are, okay, has revenue management proved itself that it doesn't need to be in a chair in a hotel? Can it be done as as good, if not better, externally from a centralization or third party? And 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 can it, can it be successful and is it cost effective to do that, you know, in a sour comparison? Uh, marketing, do we really need somebody at the property that is doing it or do we just need somebody at the property that is policing it? 
that's responsible for the functionality and integration. With what you do from a reputation perspective, do we need a dedicated warm body at the property? Or do we need somebody that is the liaison for the property for someone with you, you know, that you can work and facilitate with? So I'll ask you from just that perspective first. Yeah, I know for for what what I do, I empower the team. I give them the guidance that they need so that they can do it. That is because I can't deliver great service from my office in South Carolina if the hotel is somewhere else. The leadership has to do it. And, and I really see the work as um, it's, it's about, it's about inspiring the team and helping them. And it actually helps them have more energy and less stress uh, when you when you work this way. You have more energy and less stress because you see things going in a positive direction and you're getting a lot of appreciation from from above. But I can't I can't deliver that because I'm not the 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 boss of that property. The boss of that property needs to go around and saying, well done. I really like the way you handled that. I can't I can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't give the pat on the you don't actually pat people anymore, but I can't give the proverbial pat on the back to to somebody who I noticed really went out of their way for somebody. I I can't do that. I can't pin uh, signs and and things in the back office, but I can take someone who's um, maybe inexperienced only has a certain level of experience but is a savvy person with a great attitude and a great aptitude and i can show them how to perform like somebody who's been doing it for many many years because they can take my experience and and you know a system that has worked at so many different places and apply it so in that way i can i can support them not necessarily having they don't need a me on the on the on the team but they do do need somebody who's going to embrace the work okay to get more personal for me cuz i mean i was often approached with if somebody's learning what you do cuz i often when I work with clients, say I'm willing to also teach whom you want internally to understand the methodologies of this. I go through a progression of relationship because whenever I get into a relationship with a client, just as introspection, I also have an end goal in mind. I'm not there to find residual demand. I don't try to find some symbiotic demand that they always need me around for. Like, oh, that's what I do. If you want this done, I have to be the one that does it. I'm like, look, I'm here to solve what it is you're bringing me on board for. We establish the goal. We establish the KPIs. We establish what needs to succeed with it. When we're done with that, if there's nothing else you need me to do, I ride off in the sunset, very proud of what I've done. Or if you find something else for me to do, I'll stay around and do it. I'll also show your team how to do things. So I go from a facilitator that does everything to a policeman, to a counselor, to a guru, which is just break class when you need me in the next time and I'm done. With that being said, people go and say, well, that seems very, you know, that doesn't seem like long-term business success. I'm like, no, there's plenty of people who need this. Um, but the the idea of it was, well, if you're teaching people what you're doing, aren't you teaching them out of your job? And I'm like, yeah, just like when I was a manager, I wanted people to work with me that wanted my job because that way somebody could do my job when I was looking to do something different. So yeah, it's a matter of progression. You know, you can't create a void moving forward. You literally push everything up with you. That being yeah. said, um, how did you transition with what you did? Because you had the title, you had the authority. You walked into one of the library collections. They knew, one, who you were, two, what you were there for, and three, you better listen to her because when she told you to do it, she not only is right about what she's doing, she also has the authority to make that happen. Now you're walking in with the, I know what you need to do, but I don't have the title behind me to make you do it. I have to show you why it's valuable for you to make that choice. How did you transition? Uh, you know what? I, I want to say that, at the library hotel collection, I absolutely made it my business to do. I, I, I was always striving to be a consultant. You're the general manager, you're the director of sales and marketing, you're the team on the ground here, but I, and, and I'm here to help you uh, be 
the best you, you can be and have the greatest success. And I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of the owner that, you know, we do have a vision of that we want to be the kindest hoteliers and we want to make sure everybody leaves happy so that we don't have to spend money on advertising. Sorry, Lauren. <laughs> so that we don't have to spend so much money on advertising because our our customers are doing the the promotion of the hotel for us. So it was always consultative because if I just told them what to do, they would not want to do it. But if I gave them ideas on, well, how, well, what if we tried it this way? Or what do you think we could do, do better? Oh, that sounds like a great idea. I only wonder about these unintended consequences. What if um, we adjusted it a little bit instead? So kind, kind of getting to the point of what you said, but also making sure that these things don't happen or what do you think of this? And then we'd all walk, walk away from the table agreeing on something that is much better than the idea I had on my own or the idea he had on his own or the idea that she had on their own. We, we came to something that we can all get behind and say, well, let's test it and see how it works. And, and that's how we did it. So, I mean, I was never, I, I certainly <laughs> believe I, I never had a di dictatorship and I didn't have the power that that's that they were the general managers and the directors of sales and marketing and the front office managers, et cetera. But yeah. I can tell, I, I just told them this is the, the company vision and goal and how can we work together to make this happen? How might we accomplish these goals? Strange as it may sound, I actually spend more time convincing ownerships of how little they have to spend or not to spend. As a matter of fact, suspending time because the reality of it is, is that um, paying for platforms amplifies the platform's value. That's it because it's a pay for play society that we're in. Facebook's that way. Google's that way. Google has a little bit more of a caveat to it because they have to provide the value proposition to the user more often. So they still need the organic placement to it, but they've pushed that down so far that it doesn't have the value that it once had because it has so much Google in front of it. It has the answer box. It has the local information. It has all these things that Google provides. And then quickly it shows whatever anybody's first wanting to pay for. And then it goes into whatever else organic. Um, to me, the greatest success is based more on the lesser of spend than it is the more of spend because the lesser you have to actually push the rock down the hill, the more that it moves itself, the better it is. So all that, what you're talking about, I completely agree with because if that creates that environment, that, that magical combination of management's connecting to team, team vision to management's vision, that whole collaboration that everybody sees the world in similarity that guest service is the paramount reason why we can do business as successful as we've been, then that's magic. When that happens, that doesn't require money to spend it. If anything that spends the money you're spending is to amplify what it already is doing for itself. So, you know, in that sense, but the, the other to it though is, and I, and I'll, I'll push well, because it's the data push back on Adele and some stuff. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, I think your title walked in before you as well, though, even though you yeah, sure. wanted to act that way. Sure. I think because I've worked on both the property and corporate side. I'm sorry. Anybody corporate, even if it was an administrative assistant, because she was in the same office, I treated them differently than if it was somebody else. Uh, just because they were there, whether they had the authority or not. OK, whether they took the authority that they had or not, they still were treated differently because of how they were what they represented there or the means of what they could do. So I think in some ways to that. But for you, you know, you have the, the success history that you've had. You have the reputation in the industry that you have. And so that obviously walks in the room with you when you come in to talk to these people. Um, and I guess figuratively walk in the room because for the past year we haven't walked in any rooms. Um, but the other is, is that you're convincing people of what they need to do. Do you get beyond the corporate people or do you get to actually talk to the property people now? You know what? I, I mean, I, I, I've had very, you know, like short term conversations with multiple individuals and I feel that they respond really positively because, and it, and, and what I'm saying feels like a relief to them. 
because I, I, I think they leave feeling very empowered. Uh, and I try to always talk to, you know, DOS assistant GM or GM. These are the, these are the people that are more or less at the head of the hotel. Mm -hmm. I think that I should be targeting more the ownership, to be honest with you, uh, because I, I just I don't I, I think I can only get so far in a certain way unless I do that. But, you know, as far as being hired, you know, it's it's generally mostly been outside the industry mm -hmm. that have wanted insights on on how to be more hospitality focused. Mm -hmm. it, that makes perfect sense, considering that so many people are being hired from our industry because of the talent sets that they're created from it. That, yeah. uh, that uh, empathetic awareness, that uh, in tune perspective of other people's interests, needs, challenges, whatever, which is really the core of what we tend to do mostly anyway, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a spa or golf course, it's that, how can I help you? You know? Yeah, I think that you and I are, are uh, oddballs in a way, because I, I think that you and I share that, that we really just want to help people. And mm -hmm. we want to go in and set them up for success and 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 set them on a path of continuous improvement and giving giving them good mindsets and everything so they can be strong on their own. And then whenever you need help, I'm here for you. You know, sure. let me know and and I'll I'll coach you through the individual thing. I want to try to help as many hotels as possible. So I, I'm not if I were looking to just stick with one one hotel or one brand, I would take a position at a hotel, which would be much easier for me to do, to be honest, I believe, than, mm -hmm. than it is to set up my own company. But I really want to be able to impact more people. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm gonna I'm working on a book and and an online course too. I was about to say <laughs> please do the course. I mean I will first off you have you have the the the, the yeah, you, you have all the pieces that make a wonderful dissertation course for people to learn how better to tackle these issues. And because it is amazing in what we do, we come across a variety of people that are incredibly skilled at what they do. And then they do something and you're like, wow, that's a blind spot for you, isn't it? That's just something you don't see that way. You know, there's some great hospitality people that are very logistically minded. They see things in a very linear way and or progression of things but they don't have uh, the emotional attachment to it, but they're exceptionally good at the facilitation of service. And that's the difference, I think, between the service and the hospitality. Hospitality is an emotional mindset. Hospitality is an emotional connection. Service is a, is a function. I'm providing service. I'm making sure you have what you need, when you need it, what it is you want, whatever it is, that's a service. It's transactional. Hospitality is that magic that happens. And I think I mentioned it from an article I was reading, I thought it was very well written. When you go have a dining experience back, well, I'm going pre-COVID, obviously, uh, but we had dining experience where your wine was never low to a point where you noticed. The water was never warm to a point you were like noticing. Your food was always presented well. It was disappeared when it was done cordially that you weren't feeling uncomfortable that you ate ahead of your guests, which, you know, they're still eating and your plates disappeared. And now you're sitting there with nothing and they're still eating. You know, that's not proper decor. But all of those service points where the server was engaged with you when he needed to be and invisible when he wasn't or they weren't, that's amazing hospitality. That's the sensitivity to what you're doing. It's not the timing rule, like I better go check since I dropped food on the table. It's not somebody coming up with an armful of food laying on top of each other going, uh, who's got the burger, you know, and auctioning the food off at the table. It's knowing where it goes, how it goes presenting the plate correctly so that the items are correctly in front of you. These all sound like very perturby little things, but having been a formal waiter, that's the magic that happens for somebody that is so in tune with what they're doing for you. And that's just a restaurant example. Ho hotels have all their examples too. The, the room amenities that are laid out the way that are most comfortable because the housekeeper was sensitive to how they saw the room when they cleaned it, to know how they left it so that that's the way you wanted it. You know, those things, go ahead. I, I I would add to that that it, it, all those details and all that care is really important. But on top of that, I, I, this is my my theme of the, of the month, uh, 
polite and professional is too low a bar for our mm -hmm. hospitality industry. We need to make sure everybody feels cared for, appreciated and respected at every encounter. You know, not just when they're right in front of us, but in the reservation process, you know, when we pick up the phone, every in a in a pre-stay email or a post-stay email, every mm -hmm. single thing that we mm -hmm. put out there must make them feel like we care about them. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I always refer to I, I, I'm a I'm a not very unique uh, person in the fact that I'm vegetarian and everybody has, you know, dietary preferences these days, it seems like. But when I don't see vegetarian foods on the menu or, you know, a night, a, a night and dice option, something more than just a salad, mm -hmm. I don't think you care for me or mm -hmm. you, I don't think you appreciate my business because if mm -hmm. you did, surely you, you would know that there are so many others like me who want to feel welcome in that place. And I don't want to have to beg for, for you to do something special for me. I'm just going to go someplace else next time that appreciates me enough to have taken the time to think about me. So mm -hmm. even in the things where we're not face to face, we're showing what we're made of and we're showing how much we care about people. So when, when you, when you are welcomed in a way that makes you feel cared for, appreciated and inspected and, and throughout the meal, somebody is attentive to you. That makes you feel that way. Mm -hmm. And when you leave and they say, thank you so much for being our guest. We can't mm -hmm. wait to see you again. That those little touches make all the difference. And, they, and that starts with the mindset mm -hmm. and the mindset is everything. And it's up to the leaders to inspire their teams to to access um, their strength and their resilience and their ability to out charm uh, their their clients so that they're not getting yelled at. Mm -hmm. You know, people won't be upset about a lot of little things if they just feel like you care about them. Sure. Then they'll blow it off. Well, I mean, even just going back to the, the hotel example, is that there's a difference between a housekeeper that is obligated to say hi to you because you're standing in front of them, than it is to somebody that's having a smile on their face, that's doing the stuff, that's humming, that's that's happy to do what they're doing, and you happen to come across them and they're like, oh hi, you know, you're wow. People can determine genuineness of this. We have this 520 rule and all this other stuff where it's like, okay, hi, how are you? Good to have you. Thank you for being our guest. It sounds like the automated, hi, how are you today? Nobody really is asking you that question. They're just saying those words, okay? Yes. But you can tell the genuineness of a culture of the people, where, as you said, thanks for being our guest. We're so happy you're being here, okay? I know I was being negative when I said we, we have people that, hotels that are on burnout, that they're, be, you know, be thankful that I'm here. And then we have guests that are, be thankful I'm here with you. But there also is the reverse of that, where we're thankful to see each other where you're happy to see them walk in the door going, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, you know, but, but we've hit that point where there's some hotels that are overwhelmed and they've oversold themselves. And the staff knows, if anybody knows how the, the hotel works, the staff does. And they can tell when they're past the ability to perform at the level that's not going to really irritate people and you're making them do that, there's a grudge against the people that they're making them do this. And there's a grudge against the guest That's the one extra person that they didn't want where really seriously, you have no idea what my day is like. Okay. That unfortunately comes through if there's not the true support of the team, the, the, the ownership going over. We have people on clubhouse that did this. They limited their occupancy saying, this is how many rooms we can sell because this is all we can service. And yes, we have demand for more. This is all we can service so that we must keep the, when the team knows that, they know they're being watched for and they're going to be happier to see those people because like, boy, are you lucky? I'm lucky. I can give you the service that you know, is going to make you happy. You're going to be happy with our service. And guess what? I'm happy that you're that person. And yes, it is going to cost you more to be here, but it's going to be the money you're spending is going to be validated in the service we give. Not the I'm so sorry, but we sold your room. We couldn't service. And it's at a price you have to pay and you want to be here in tough kahoogies, you know? So. Yeah. And hotels have told me that they've had to turn away people that really wanted the room and they really had the room. They just didn't have the people to clean the room. 
And they have that in restaurants too, where people go over and say, well, you have empty tables over there. Yeah, I don't yeah. have enough servers, okay? I'm sorry, I could sit you there, but then you get really mad at me that you're sitting there for an hour before I get to you because I don't have enough servers. That's my reality of my world right now as a restaurant. And again, it, it, trying to explain this, this is where, and I, we put it under the modicum of marketing, but it's actually communication. Yes. At this point, that information is about communication. It's about letting you know, this is what we're doing. I think Melissa pointed that out earlier, that you lay out what's being done. You emphasize it with what you're saying. This is what we have. This is what we're going to be doing. Be genuine, be sincere, and be truthful. And, and lay this out so that you understand that even when you walk in and you had to wait 45 minutes because you came early to your point or we ran late because whatever, it's because of these things. Yes, I have empty tables, but I can't sit you there. I don't have the staff to give you the service that we expect of ourselves for you. And our kitchen is, in, you know, we can only serve so many meals based on the crews that we have. And I'm not, we've had restaurants down here in Florida because we've been in season and also floors and politics aside, been an open state for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, down. And a lot of the restaurants have just been truly, completely overwhelmed. Uh, there is no way they can facilitate their business. There's lines of people waiting when they close the restaurant at night still waiting. It's just this, it's like a food kitchen almost. And and demand services up for deliveries. And of course, the restaurants try to gear towards that so they don't say that negatively. I, I live by restaurants where uh, the back of the restaurant is now the delivery door, you know, because they can't even have the guys come in and pick up the stuff in the front door because there's people in the front door waiting, you know. And they get the, the snide remarks, oh, great, somebody's sitting at home eating and I'm still waiting to sit here with you and eat. You know, they've had those snide remarks. So they have delivery services out the back door. And the kitchen, that's way beyond the seating capacity of the restaurant the kitchen was designed for. And so they're handling, trying to handle both the influx of both ends of the restaurant. And it's just they're failing. They're failing. And some restaurants have decided literally to close for two or three days. We're not in business Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And it's not because we don't have the business. It's because we have too much business and our, our team is toast. Our team is done. And and I'm not. And in some of the restaurants are making the news where it's like, I'm not going to do that in my crew. First off, I, I, I have open positions I can't fill. The people that I have, I'm not going to burn them out. I'm closed. I would love to have the business. That makes sense. Yeah. So all of a sudden, ooh, all right. We're at that point. <laughs> we didn't. Robert, sorry, sorry. We ran out of time for you to say. He's not even on in the chat room anymore. But uh, to Robert's point, he does uh, put a wonderfully curated list together. Uh, today was just a little late for us to try to roll it into the show that much. Um, but it's at Rock Cheetah. You can go and, and sign up for it. It's for free. It's a great list. At bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Rock Cheetah, all lowercase in the face. By all means, I highly recommend it. It's great content. Melissa and, and Fuel Travel, thank you for joining us today as well. They have, as they just rolled out last week, their consumer sentiment study number 12 which um, has some really interesting consistencies and it has some really interesting changes as with all surveys uh, for it. Um, everybody else, you know, we'll just talk about bad about them just because it is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's funny because with Clubhouse, I have them over the course of the week. So I feel really bad by dishing on them because I usually talk to them during the week. So I feel, you know, it's like, I, I, I've actually gone to a lot of them. It's like, I, oh, Dean, I feel so bad about Dean. So Tuesday, I had to get my second shot. And uh, they moved it from the morning, which I originally had scheduled, to literally at noon when I was doing the clubhouse. I'm like, okay, well, and I've, you and I've had this discussion. Consistency is king about these things. You have to always be there. So I'm soliciting everybody, but you know, it's like, please, you know, uh, the one, you know, and super things. You just run the show for me a little bit. I asked other people on it that you're always regularly there and so forth. And Dean says, well, I'll try to make it. I might be late. He says, great. I'm literally standing in line, two people in front of me to get the shot. And I start the show going, I at least I get it started, whatever. And as I get up to the front of the line, Dean pops on the show. I'm like, Dean, so good to see you. Great. Thanks for, here's your moderation. Have fun with the show. Blink and I disappear. <laughs> I, I, I tried to reach him out later. It's like, so Dean, how are you going? He says, ah, you know. It was good because <laughs> you know what it's like to run these things that you have to be kind of flexible as to the dialogue and you have to, you know, if it's, you're not just going to sit there and stare at the screen or metaphorically, uh, you know, so you have to come up with something to, to dialogue about. And, and Dean, he has his thing, meta search. I will always go to Dean about meta search. He is brilliant about meta search and he's, he's really smart about a lot of other stuff. I don't really, 
he doesn't give himself as much credit on so many other things. He's really very knowledgeable about a lot of stuff. He just yeah. is one of those people that if he doesn't feel totally qualified speaking about it, he won't really talk about it. And it's like, Dean, dude, you really, you could really open up a lot broader about what you're talking about. I mean, I say the same about you in lots of ways too. You're brilliant at what you do. And you're really brilliant about a lot of stuff, but you just don't talk about it as much as you do. You're usually, yours is you know, reputation. Man, you know, <laughs> I will always tell you about that. But by the same token, you know a lot of stuff. Yeah, just, I, I was, I was, I was VP of Sales, Marketing, and Revenue. Right? It's just yeah. Like, so you do, you have a lot of tangent <laughs> stuff. I just, you know, I, I know, I know this is your It's like with me, people come and say, "Oh, Lauren, we want to do this with marketing." And it's like it's not hospitality. I can help you with people that I know that can do really good with you. I just pick a lane. It's hospitality. That's my lane. Uh, you know, I just, I stay there. I mean, I'll have an opinion about anything all, all day long. You know that. But uh, I, when it comes to actually doing work, work stuff, it's, I like to stick with the hospitality thing. I, that's my, that's my thing. But for you, honestly, I keep, I, it's like, man, there's so many other things you <laughs> can talk about sales wise and everything else that I know you could tap into, but I'll just keep dragging you into uncomfortable circumstances. <laughs> I love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Any who's all right with that in mind, Adele, for people to find you, where is it they can go? Uh, you can visit my website, adelegutman.com, and uh, you will also find there links to the Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast with my co host, Lauren. <laughs> Actually, I'm, 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 a, I'm a token host, uh, I'll be token. honest. I'm, I'm the token, token intro, host. I'm the token host. <laughs> The podcast is yours. I'm, I'm, I'm the producer with the uh, uh, was the paid off credit of saying yes, yes. It's uh, I'm a part of this. It's like, yeah, I'm the intro. Uh, no, no fooling about it. I'm the intro to your podcast. Well, um, I, I had a I had a really nice uh, conversation with Stuart Butler, which was the latest one on the podcast, and the next one coming up is my conversation with Christine Trippy who is a incredible hospitality trainer and uh, I, and the author of um, Yes is the Answer or something like that. Nice. <laughs> the nice. I, uh, um, um, I'm talking to, uh, I think, Carrie today. Yeah. Um, who, you introduced me to somebody. Who was it you just introduced? Ellie. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Carrie L. Yeah, Carrie. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm talking to her too. Yay. So she'll be on the show pretty soon. To, uh, that's what I'm talking to her. It's right. like, hey, so what's going right. on? With, you know, um, and she's with Virtuoso. And I mean, anyway, it, it's, it's going to be. I'm going to find out what she's she wants with to do. The, the uh, hotels network. That's it. That's fantastic it. tool. A fantastic tool. But now they've come up with a free forever tool. You don't even have to be one of the paid members. Nice. Uh, nice. But they do have a paid, great paid tool. Cool. Well, with that in mind, oh, for them to find your podcast, what's the link to the podcast? Um, the, I come to AdeleGutman.com and, and you'll find the, the okay. podcast there okay. and it's on Spotify and Amazon and Apple podcasts. And my favorite is Audible. It's there too. <laughs> now we do have, uh, a Lily who has not been with us for a while. So we're going to have to give her grief when we finally see her again. Uh, Lily Mockerman has her, uh, revenue management podcast. Uh, she had two weeks ago, she's up for a new one coming up. I think she hasn't sent it to me yet to produce, but, uh, she did one, uh, episode number 29. I think it was her last one. Um, she has really fascinating conversations. Uh, Dean just started rolling out his new versions of his podcast and he just rolled out episode seven last week. I think it was. And, uh, Holly Zoba, sales and marketing. She's due for a podcast. She, she does about once a month. So she isn't worried about the subscription follow-ups as people that are interested when they're looking for the content. She went for that angle and I'm like, it's yours to do. So she has a sales one and then uh, yours for reputation, mine for hospitality marketing. Uh, we recap this show and Clubhouse now. So we do that in news tools and stuff. I always talk about whiz bang tools. Um, and then our Clubhouse, uh, Monday through Thursday at noon. Um, for those who want to, this show to replay, we do replay it uh, for different time zones, Wednesday, 11.30 a.m. Sydney time and 11.30 a.m. UK time. We do a rebroadcast of the show. We also translate it into 11 languages, uh, the subtitles anyway. Uh, and uh, you can find this and all previous 297 shows uh, at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. For this show, just look for show number 298. And with that, Adele, thank you for the whole time. <laughs> uh, for joining in yeah, and for letting me wrestle with you on some topics. 
I know what works. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you if you, if it isn't, you're already spending too much time on Clubhouse already. Uh, well, I'll see you at noon sometime next week. And if not, I will see you hopefully next Friday, 1130 a.m. Eastern for this one. Thank you so much. Have a great week, everyone. You too. Bye now. Bye.